If you've been told you can't build muscle on carnivore, today I'm going to be your friendly neighborhood myth buster. Healthline ran a piece asking, can you build muscle on a carnivore diet? The short answer was yes, if you lift and eat enough. But then came a familiar but and the possible long-term risk. So let's react like a scientist, not a zealot. And if you're new here, I'm Dr. Tony Hampton, a family physician, obesity specialist, and root cause guy. And I'm going to show you how your body actually builds muscle on an all animal, very low carb way of eating, what the evidence says about performance, and where the real risk lives. Spoiler alert, processed meat isn't the same as ribeye, and fear of protein might be aging you faster than the steak ever could. First principle, muscle is a protein turnover machine. Resistance training turns on muscle protein synthesis. Dietary amino acids, especially leucine, are the trigger to build new contractile proteins. Animal proteins are naturally rich in essential amino acids and leucine, which is why a 20 to 40 gram protein dose containing approximately two to three grams of leucine maximally stimulates muscle protein synthesis in most adults. That's Sports Nutrition 101, confirmed many times over. In fact, a comprehensive analysis of protein sources found animal proteins generally deliver more essential amino acids per gram and higher leucine density than most plant isolates, which is why whey protein outperforms soy or wheat on a gram for gram basis unless you bump protein dosages. Practically, eight ounces of steak or a few eggs can clear the leucine threshold with ease. But you may ask, but doc, can you actually gain on low carb? Well, based on systemic reviews in strength athletes, ketogenic or very low carb diets preserve or improve strength and can build muscle if total calories and protein are adequate. Hypertrophy is not impaired when programmed correctly. Where people run into trouble is under eating or confusing contest prep shredded with building. In short, lift, hit total daily energy, nail protein, salt appropriately, and you can grow. Yes, even in ketosis. You may also ask, what about glycogen? Even when carbs are very low, you still make glycogen via gluconeogenesis, and trained lifters maintain performance after adaptation. Endurance literature shows keto-adapted athletes replete glycogen and oxidize more fat. In the gym, that translates to stable strength as long as you're not chronically under-recovered. Practically, program smart, keep electrolytes up, and your bar speed won't care how many bread rolls you skipped. Now let's address the Healthline long-term risk claims in the article. First up, inflammation. Multiple randomized trial meta-analyses report that ketogenic or low-carb diets reduce key inflammatory cytokines like IL-6 and TNF-alpha with mixed but generally small effects on CRP. Translation, in the population study, often insulin resistant or excess adiposity, keto trends anti-inflammatory, not pro-inflammatory. When insulin falls and visceral fat shrinks, the immune signals calm down. Metabolic health, not macronutrient politics, drives most of that story. Others may ask, red meat causes disease. Let's separate processed from unprocessed. Processed meats are a different animal, literally. And several bodies classify them as carcinogenic with small but consistent associations. And as you may already know, association does not equal causation. And it definitely says nothing about grass-fed ribeye. For unprocessed red meat, high-quality assessments rate the casual evidence as weak or very low certainty, with small relative risk that can disappear depending on comparators or confounders. Some modern analysis explicitly labeled the signal weak evidence. What matters most? Context. The rest of your diet your insulin status, body fat distribution, cooking methods, and rather we're talking bologna or brisket. Finally, you may also ask, but doc, what about diabetes and heart disease? Mechanisms first. High insulin states drive fat storage in the liver and belly, dyslipidemia and vascular inflammation. When we remove the glycemic load, you often see triglycerides drop, HDL climb, and glycemia normalize. That's not a theoretical TikTok hack. It's been followed for years in clinical cohorts. 
in a five-year extension, a very low carb continuous care intervention delivers sustained weight loss, improved hemoglobin A1Cs, higher HDL, lower triglycerides, and no adverse rise in total cholesterol. About one third hit hemoglobin A1Cs less than 6.5% on no meds or metformin only. Real bodies, real labs, real longevity markers. What about the claim about faster aging from high protein in the article? In mice, maybe. In older humans, low protein accelerates sarcopenia, fragility, falls, hospitalizations, and the loss of independence. Expert groups like the ProAge study here and the European Society for Clinical Nutrition and Metabolism teams recommend 1 to 1.2 grams per kilogram per day minimum protein for healthy adults over 65, and 1.2 to 1.5 grams per kilogram per day with illness or training. Translation for my clinic, adequate protein is anti-fragility medicine. The longevity we want is not just more candles or the cake. It's strength, balance, and a life you can enjoy. Mechanistically, mTOR activation from protein is pulsatile, not chronic. Resistance training keeps tissues insulin sensitive, and retraining lean mass reduces biological age risk. So what about nutrient deficiencies like vitamin C and magnesium, you may ask? Meat is not empty. Fresh muscle meat has small amounts of vitamin C. Organs and certain seafood have more. And when carb intake is low, competing glucose transport and oxidative demands may change vitamin C needs. Still, scurvy is a clinical diagnosis I have not seen in my carnivore patients who eat fresh meat and variety. What about magnesium? That's a reasonable watch out on low carb because insulin drops increase renal electrolyte losses during adaptation. Many athletes benefit from 200 to 400 milligrams magnesium glycinate nightly and adequate sodium and potassium, especially if they train hard. Mechanism, not magic. And now let's address the article's comments about impaired immunity. Again, context, hyperglycemia impairs immune cells. Keto lowers glycemic variability and can attenuate inflammatory signaling. In practice, my patient's infections risk tracks with obesity, diabetes control, sleep, stress, micronutrient status, and sunlight. Not rather they ate brisket. Let's keep our eyes on their root cause, metabolic dysfunction. So can you build muscle on carnivore? Absolutely, if you do the basics right. Here's my clinic playbook for lifters who choose carnivore. One, set calories according to your goal. Building requires a surplus. Chasing shredded and swole at the same time is a young influencer's fantasy. Two, protein to target. About 1.6 to 2.2 grams per kilogram per day for most lifters. If you're older on meds or rehabbing, I often keep you toward the higher end. Three, hit the leucine threshold at each meal. For most people, that's 30 to 50 grams high quality protein per meal from ruminant meat, eggs, dairy if tolerated, or fish. Four, salt your food and supplement electrolytes during adaptation. Cramps and fatigue are usually sodium and magnesium, not a carb deficiency. Five, train hard with progressive overload. 1 to 20 heart sets per muscle per week, 1 to 3 reps in reserve. 6. Sleep like it's your job. Growth happens when insulin is low and recovery hormones are doing their night shifts. Want receipts on performance? You'll find studies where keto athletes match strength gains and adequate protein and calories while dropping fat mass faster, a body recoup win many folks actually want. But my pump you may say. Carbohydrates can transiently increase cell volume if you miss that feel. Have a pre-lift bolus of electrolytes or if you use a targeted approach, a small carb intake around training. Still compatible with most carnivore frameworks if you're in a performance block. The rule is simple. Let your program dictate your carbs, not your ideology. Now, I'm going to steel man Healthline. They correctly note research directly on carnivores limited, and some epidemiology links high meat patterns to disease risk. Fair. But it's also fair to say the signal from unprocessed red meat is weak with low certainty evidence, and it gets confounded by lifestyle patterns. If your meat diet includes soda, fries, seed oil fried sides, 
midnight Netflix, and no steps, don't blame the stake. In contrast, the most rigorous long-term interventional data we have in high-risk populations, people with type 2 diabetes, show multi-year improvements on very low-carb therapy. Weight down, triglycerides down, HDL up, inflammation down, and medication burden down. In clinic, that means fewer amputations, fewer dialysis chairs filled, and more grandparents on the floor playing with toddlers. That's what we're really after. Bottom line as your carnivore-friendly doctor, muscle is built by training and protein, not by worshiping carbs. If you choose carnivore, you can absolutely get bigger and stronger while improving metabolic risk, provided you eat enough, train smart, and monitor labs. If something's off, things like LDL particle number, iron levels, uric acid, or blood pressure. We adjust, we cut processed meats, mine cooking methods, add seafood, rotate cuts in organs, and optimize electrolytes. That's not dogma, that's medicine. Well, that's my two cents on this topic. And if this helped, drop where you're watching from. Smash that like button for the algorithm gods and share this with your friend who says you need cereal for muscle gains. I'll link the studies in the description so you can read them for yourself. Stay strong, stay kind, and I'll see you in the next one.